um, because I want to make sure that I've got enough time for for my friend Bob Wyborn, who has been uh, an outstanding um, contributor to the ALD community. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to spend the next few minutes talking about uh, how we can enhance the quality of life for those with advanced cerebral um, ALD. And I'm going to suggest to you that there is another way that we can do things. And, um, and I've listed here a statement of purpose, and I want to also state right here that there are two words there that have different meaning in America than elsewhere. So please don't start throwing things at me. Um, and those words are a hospice and palliative care, neither of which mean death. Uh, and nor am I referring to that in, in this uh, discussion. So my suggestion is that we can enhance this quality through the introduction of a positive palliative care system from the very start of diagnosis. So that we can also then develop a caring plan. And a caring plan is not a treatment plan. I'll go into what, what I mean by that. And it's for the entire, mem uh, the entire family and it's put together by the medical team at the time of diagnosis. We should establish hospice access for all members of the family. And that may sound strange because hospice here means basically that's where we put you for end of life. That's not what I'm referring to. And we need to establish uh, a family su grief support system at the time when the loss commences. And when's that? at the diagnosis. Uh, and that needs to carry on through the whole, pro the, whole the, the illness as well as at least 12 months afterwards. I sometimes wonder if we, we speak the same language, uh, and I'm not necessarily referring to you know, American and Australian, I'm just referring to sometimes that we've really changed the meaning of words. Uh, so I want to address some words that we will be talking about uh, mental health, I'll suggest you is an oxymoron. It's been totally and terminally debased, and it simply means mad, or sometimes more amusingly, he or she chucked a mentally. <laughs> Palliative care is in grave danger, uh, and we must resuscitate it before it just simply means death or hopeless. Instead of cure unknown, concentrate on the quality of life. And death, a word that seems to frighten everybody, is a perfectly natural word that creates abnormal anxiety about an unhappened event that is totally fueled by fear. So I'm suggesting that we change the word mental health to something similar to cognitive and emotional well-being. Because we need to concentrate on those matters that deal with how we process or make sense of the information that we have at our disposal, and of equal importance is how we reach an internal understanding of those things that, that affect our subjective life. In other words, our feelings. Or should that be feelings? Palliative care is rapidly becoming a phrase that has very negative undertones, and we often shun it before we realise uh, just how brilliant and excellent it is. And it's very understandable when we have a health system that is money driven, uh, that requires the precise moment of death to be determined as that's the point from which palliative care starts. And then we have to go and get a doctor to, to prognosticate on that, on what that time is. I can tell you, you get better odds at the racetrack. <laughs> the data tells us how very inaccurate doctors are across all their um, specialities at, at predicting you know, the time, of, uh, the time of death. And I have fears that that also negatively impacts on the quality of care that is given in that period. So the best phrase that I can come up with, and I'm, my hand's up for help to find a better one, is positive palliative care. Palliative care, the word palliative comes from the Latin verb meaning to cloak. And all our understandings and efforts must shift to a total concentration on covering our loved one with all those actions and plans that will alleviate their distress, pain and fear and enable them to accomplish all their unfinished wishes 
during their final stage of growth. It is a positive mutual experience and it's about the presence of quality, not its absence. Death, humankind's oldest or equally oldest experience, still, rem still remains taboo. People didn't die in our hospitals, as Elizabeth Kubler-Ross found out in 1965, and I sometimes wonder if they still do. People do not pass away despite the vibrantly sincere voices that TV newsreaders use. Neither do we lose them, nor are they gone, cactus, carted or shuffled off, as Hamlet said. They die, and their memory is not enhanced by the use of isolating euphemisms. And I have some news for all of us. There's every chance we're going to die. Now I look at that slide and I see that, that, that the odds of being taken by a shark are 10 million to one. And every time that happens, it makes the news and the radio, the TV. We go on for days about we're going to kill every shark that ever swam. I wonder where the uproar is for a 21,000th one little boy when he dies of ALD. I don't hear the world screaming. But I'm going to suggest that it's not all doom and gloom on death. And this is my, the approach I'm trying to get us to look at, is that Charlie Brown is saying, someday we will all die, Snoopy. And Snoopy says, true, but on all other days we'll live. And I had a son who lived for 4,150 days. And on the 4,150th day, for a brief period in his life, in a peaceful time, he died. For the rest of it, he lived. And he taught me a great deal. And he taught me a great deal when he was in a state that, that we would have preferred he wasn't. And they become great teachers to us all. So my suggestion in all of this topic is about life, living, and, and maximising the quality. <clears throat> I'm going to use uh, this definition, which is a, a UK definition, but I'm also going to apply it to adults. And really the difference between adult, pediat adult uh, palliative care and paediatric care is really just simplistically the diseases that children get as opposed to the ones that adults get. And we make decisions for our children, adults make their own. So, so what I'm saying is that palliative care for children and young people and adults with life-limiting conditions is an active and total approach to care from the point of diagnosis or recognition throughout the child's life, death and beyond. It embraces physical, emotional, social and spiritual elements and focuses on the enhancement of the quality of life for the child, young person and adult and support for the family. And it includes the management of distressing conditions, provisions of short break in care throughout death and bereavement. So positive palliative care is about living. It has very little to do with death. It starts, as I've said, about six times at the date of diagnosis. And that delivery of diagnosis has to be done in a caring and loving and informative manner. And we need to establish you know, best practice protocols uh, that we can use not only here but all around the world. I am suggesting that we should get early referral at, the, at that time to a positive palliative care team. And the advantage of that, to do that early, is they come to meet you and they know your family and you know your needs and your wants and, and your cultural habits. Um, you may not need them for quite some time, but that's when you establish and start it and you know these people. You don't lose your doctor, you just get another backup team. And I know from talking, you know, my own experience and talking to other families and seeing other families that they can be, the child can be going fairly well, but they've, they've got one little problem. Let's say it's drooling. Well, you can call in the palliative care team who are experts at that. They deal with that. They go back to their life when you've fixed, you know, you resolve your problem. So it allows, as I say, for that specialised, you know, medicine. That's one of the great advantages of it. This is really the what palliative care is. It affirms life, 
and it regards dying as a normal process. It intends to neither hasten or postpone death. It supports patients to live as actively and as possible until death. It uses a holistic approach and it is applicable early in the course of the illness. <clears throat> so to go back to the diagnosis stage, um, I believe we need to get a family meeting and I tell you that 20 years ago in a few weeks, this happened to my family. Uh, that a meeting was arranged where the, the parents or the family members that wanted to be present at that very initial point, we get together in a room and we draw up a caring plan. And am I a, a caring plan is not a treatment plan. This caring plan involves all the people that you're going to be involved with through that whole course of the illness. So you've got the doctor, you've got everyone sitting in a room. You have the family there. And you let the family know and write as a written document, this is, this is the support system you have. So we're going to start putting our arms around you right at this very minute, and they're going to stay there all the way through. And one of the things I want to get across to, to, uh, to the medical profession is that a happy family makes a much happier medical team. What's happened here, mate? Well, there we go. So this is what we're setting up to do. We have the family and the patient. The family and the patient is the centre of everything. And around that, we have the medical team, the nursing team, the social care people, the physiotherapists, the chaplains, uh, music therapy, brilliant music therapy, dietetics, OTs, a bereavement team. We have hospice, and we're going to talk more about what I mean by hospice sh shortly. Speech therapists, um, and it is a bit of a juggling act because you need them all in different, you know, different times, and you may need some of them at the same time. But it's done in a collaborative way and a con you know consult uh, consultative way, and also very much in a caring way. And this is the model, you know, for adults as well. What's What's happening here, young? There we go. Now, the caring plan I'm talking about. This is, um, this is what we did 20-odd years ago. It, but essentially what we did, is, you know, I've broken it up into a diagnosis, you know, the diagnosis stage, which is where we get people together, and we slowly in introduce them to the information that they need to know. And often that's a drip feed process. Um, because you're in shock, takes you ages to get used to the news, and you don't understand a whole heap of stuff. So we need to be very conscious of, that, of how we deliver that. And you can ascertain that at that, at that, at that initial meeting. Um, and it may be you know, that you come back later to have the, the full-on you know, meeting where you've, you've made up all your questions and the things you need. What's wrong with me? OK. Um, and that's where I believe we need to set, where we need to set that up. And we need to set up the caring and the support system there. And one of the things that I've underlined is all parties. Where's the care and support system for the doctors, the nurses, and all the rest of it? That's what I look for, and I don't often see it. I don't see it brilliantly <laughs> always there for the families, but we need to set it up for everybody. We all need to be involved. And that's the point where we find a 24-7 phone number. And I, there is no excuse that I, I will accept that we can't do that in any hospital uh, anywhere in the world. And I don't want to hear about weekends and holidays. If we can't set that system up, well, there's something horribly wrong. Because we need to contact, we need help. And it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and it's Sunday. Kids have got a horrible habit of getting sick in the inconvenient time. So we need to have that system there. Then we've got the maintenance stage, which is you know, the, the core of the time that we have there. Um, so that's where the therapy goes on. Uh, we need to have, it's uh, obviously essential to have good communication between the medical team and the non-medical team. We all need to know what we're saying. We all need to be saying the same thing. We need to, I suggest we need to have three monthly meetings with that whole team that I refer to that sits around the table, and children may need more one-on-one. -on -one. 
and particular siblings. You know, we need to, the siblings may want to be talking, you know, to, to uh, social workers or the like, uh, you know, with their problems that they have or the things they see. Then we come to the completion stage, which is always very, very difficult. Um, must be very much obviously patient-orientated, uh, patient but we must never, ever leave the, the rest of the family out. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, mate. So what's, do we have any evidence? Yes, we have a pile of evidence that early positive palliative care works. We know statistically that it leads to a significant improvement in both the quality of life and also the mood or the emotional state of the family and the, and the person. We know that less aggressive life, care at the end of life does not adversely affect survival. We know those with early palliative care survive longer. And those referred to a hospice program uh, suggest that care better, results in better management, symptom management, stabilisation, and also prolonged survival. Thanks, mate. Okay, the first hospice was built in 1065 in the UK. And it was built as they are these days, for shelter and for rest. And that's what I'm, I'm, and I'll explain. My concept of hospice is like it is outside of this country, although you have a few. It's a standalone, non-government building, non-government -st staff, non-bureaucratic, and it has, depending, eight or 12 rooms for eight or 10 children, um, with family rooms adjoining, um, and it's there for respite, uh, and also for clinical care. But you may be wanting to go to a show, say, in a different town or uh, wherever you are, and you ring up the hospice and you, book, and you book yourself in, it's all free. You take your child in there, you go to see your show that night, you can come back and stay there for days or you can, or you can go home. Anything goes wrong, they've got the best clinical care that is available. Um, and that's what I'm meaning by hospice. And that's how the hospices work. Um, and Jean, the very first one in Australia, uh, in the US, I mean, sorry, was in Brantford, Connecticut. And it's still there and it's still functioning. The UK has 54 children's hospices. And they look after, they give clinical care to 11,628 children with all life-limiting illnesses per annum. The US has got two, George Mark House in California, and Ryan House in, um, in Arizona. You should have 265 to, to match the UK. We've only got three. We've got very special kids in Melbourne, Bear Cottage in Sydney, and Hummingbird House in Brisbane. We should have 20. The bottom one, the UK's got 150 dedicated adult hospices that cater for the 18 to 35, as well as all other ages. And I think anyone who knows the danger of going from 17 to 18, you're a child, now you're an adult, um, that problem uh, and falling through the cracks is enormous. So what I'm suggesting is that we, we would have, the ideal situation is to have the choice of the three things. You have hospice for respite. You have the hospital for emergency. And you have home where you really want to be. And you can use those three things to maximise the quality of care you know, for your loved one. So one of the things that I was absolutely lousy at, I think I'd been the worst, was self-care. So I'm standing here as a bit of a hypocrite, but I, all I want to do is get it across. What the Dalai Lama says, in dealing with those who are undergoing great suffering, if you feel burnout setting in, if you feel demoralised and exhausted, it is best for the sake of everyone to withdraw and restore yourself. The point is to have a long-term perspective. Um, and I can't, you know, I will re repeat and repeat that. It damn this thing makes it life very difficult to live in your personal relationships. I know that I was an angry fellow, um, which wasn't terribly appreciated by my then wife, nor my, my then loving daughter. You just get out of whack, so you take time out. Hospice does that as well. In a, you know, in turn, we have hospice in all sorts of ways, and I'm sure you do. I have done a bit of homework here. 
is that where they can come to the home um, and, you know, and leave, you leave your child at home and you go out. Or you go for a, away for a weekend or whatever. Thanks, Dean. So when we come to the completion of that journey, um, and usually you know, after the blur of the, you know, the funeral and our friends can go back to the reality that life does go on and our caring regime, regime ceases, we are very often left bewildered, bashed, bereft and unsupported. So I'm enforcing again that it is critical that, that grief and bereavement component that we put into our caring plan really starts its most important journey. And that goes on for at least 12 months. Because there's another journey when this finishes. And it's not a pleasant one either. And you need all the support that you can get. And I look at families these days, five, six, seven years down the track, and no one ever put their arms around them, you know, through, you know, through any form of grief or support system. Thanks, mate. So grief is not something that happens to you. It's something you do. It doesn't operate on hospital or business hours. So we need to establish that support from all our sources, from the hospital and from the hospice and from the community. You know, you have compassionate friends and like organisations in the community. And they need to set up a program that responds on a daily basis, a weekly basis, monthly and yearly basis. And it needs to encompass your children very, and all family members. You know, what about grandma? Grandma's got a granddaughter and a grandchild that she's grieving for. We need to really put our arms around everybody. So what are our, how do we change all this? Very first thing we need to do, I think we need to educate doctors at point of training far better than we do. In my state of uh, University of Queensland, which is, uh, has done some brilliant work in the exome field, um, do you know how much time Doctors, in time, doctors learn about history. It's less than 10 minutes. And they come out and they're a doctor and hang up a shingle. That's just disgraceful. So I'm working on ways we can change the books. Ch you know, who writes the books? How do we change it? How do we get leukodystrophy in there? We need to diagnose much earlier with whole exome and genome sequencing. We need to connect our friends you know, our families into this caring plan I was talking about, where we sit down and everyone knows what they're doing. We have a palliative care system. Um, we have hospice uh, available to us. Video visits, they must have something similar here, I imagine. Uh, video visits where the doctor talks to the patient, you know, on a video link up. And we do pop-up visits where a group of doctors get together and just go out to the scrub in the bush uh, and land in the town and look after that whole, that whole area. We need to build synergies. I, I heard this mentioned before. Every patient that, that I'm involved with is, because leukodystrophy is a neuromuscular condition, every single patient that I have, f family, I don't like to work with patient terribly much, uh, is linked to muscular dystrophy, Queensland. So that simply means that they get everything that I can offer, they get everything that the government system helps, health system offers and it meets everything muscular dystrophy can give them. So I link them also to Anglicare, which has a very good Anglic Anglican church program, which is a very good external program, you know, that gets mum out, you know, mum and the other family members out of the house. Um, and some of these, Anglicare also has a, you know, care providing. So some of these families get three lots of physio. And I keep telling them double dip, triple dip, dip as many times as you can. And it's all for nothing. And then linked with all the other progressive neurodegenerative diseases. Now, every single, I'm, I'm involved with all of them. If I need information on epilepsy, I ring Epilepsy Queensland and say, hey, I've got a little you know, baby boy here with some problems. You know, can you help? So I think you really need to do that. We need to do that. Establish a network. This is vital. I think we need to establish a network of credential mentors all around the world that people can talk to. Um, and they need to be credentialed. People who can tell families and, not, and get rid of some of the misinformation um, so they can provide them details on resources and researchers, uh, trial information and where to find the experts. Thanks, man. And I'll finish with this. I'll suggest to you that there is no other way. You'll either, if you really want success, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. 
And I don't think we have room to make excuses in this room. So thank you. That is my references. Just to say that I did reference it, but yeah. But yeah. Okay. Stunned everyone, did I? <laughs> yes. We need a mic, I think. What percent of uh, the people are uh, government supported and what percent come from the private community of volunteers? As in? In Queensland. In Queensland. Yeah, I just want to, what percent are you talking about in uh, the health the, system? The, or? Uh, the people who come with the first diagnosis to visit uh, the patient's family in their house. Those individuals, are they on the government payroll? Are they volunteers like yourself oh, okay. from sorry, the community? Sorry, I'm sorry for being a bit slow there. Right. Um, the majority are private, but government funded. Right. That's confused you. <laughs> because what happens, we have service providers, individual private companies that can, that can go, that get funding to deal with all of these families that go into the houses and help people. I don't think that's what you wanted the answer. No, no. Uh, and a second point. This is a three-legged stool. You said okay. we have the volunteer hospice separate yep. building, not enough of them. Okay. Yep. And uh, it will be a long time uh, in America before the 265 number is made. Hmm. But could the system be of help? Would the stool stand on two legs if you had the other two of the three items? Because there are lots of volunteers here. Yes, I think... Yes, it would, but not, not as good as it could, but it would be, it would be an improvement, wouldn't it? It would be an improvement. Yeah. Last question. Yeah, sure. You're very courageous. You said on the day of diagnosis, we would like to visit this family. And we would go easy at the beginning and mm. we'd introduce the mm. topic slowly, but we'd like to make a contact. Mm -hmm. Have you been, have you faced outright rejection because you came on the first day? Or do, uh, you'll, feel, you'll meet shock, you admitted it, but do most people come round and are glad you came the first day? I'll answer the question this way, yes. And the other one is that, that I was really aiming that, is that what, that's what we need to do as a medical profession. So when, when you get called back into the hospital to get told the bad news, that's when the clinician should, what I'm suggesting, that's when the clinician says, we need to talk to you um, because this is serious, this is what, you know, it is this. Uh, now, what we'd like to do is to get a, a meeting with, with your family members, you know, maybe mum doesn't want to come, maybe dad doesn't want to come the next time, or maybe you want to bring grandma, you know, you all want to come. There's a series of, what we're telling you, your child has this, there's a series of questions you you may wish to ask us, and we suggest that you do that. And when you come back, we'll have everyone in that room that you're ever going to deal with. So we'll have all those people around that circle. Now, when, and that has happened. That happened to moi, um, and that's why I adopted it way back then. But I adopted it as a medical model. Now, when I get involved, if what happens now, more, more than it should, is that I'm the one who ends up breaking the news. And that, I always get, when, I do, when that happens, I talk to the family. I talk to mum and dad, and I say, well, what do you want to know? And usually one will say, I want to know the truth, and the other say, I don't want to know anything. So we often walk out of the house, the backyard somewhere, or, or wherever it is, and I tell that member what he wants or she wants to know. I would never blurt out to anyone, um, you know, well, you've got this, and your child's going to die, so nothing you can do about it, pal. Um, but that's about as abrupt as it gets sometimes from, it has been from the medical. I mean, I know when I was told. Right. I wasn't told. You know. right. Thank you. No, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, fathers, uh, 
uh, alluding and the questions and are tying to some of the themes uh, that we struggle with as a healthcare profession because we associate a lot of what you talked about and whether it's palliative care or hospice with giving up and dying with giving up mm. and these are negative connotations that we have to overcome um, because uh, we, we should be able in life to uh, admit that we can strive while mm. at the cell, same time understand that we have weaknesses, right? And coming back to the theme of virility, right? And what men should be mm. and that they should be strong and so on and so forth. We define a lot of our life as accomplishment, right? Mm. And clearly disease is, uh, is the big rectifier here, but in a good way, right? It sort of mm. also teaches you about, uh, about the meaning of life. So, I, um, Patty? I wanted to uh, ask help and this is like i don't know how to say but really begging for the developed world to start developing care for the entire world and i do believe this is our responsibility i come from a latin american country that is not that underdeveloped argentina but there is healthcare system but it's only accessible to a fraction of people and so imagine what happens when you have a rare disease because I just speak Spanish, I happen to be the person that Latin America and people with Hispanic uh, language reach out to me. Um, I probably have more than 250 ALD patients. Majority of them are cerebral ALD. That's when desperation is the highest. The needs are the highest. Uh, and I wanted to say, you show a, a beautiful model. Like I just look at it and it's like, ha. Huh. Resources like that, if it would, it would take like 15 years, for it to 50 years, it would take probably a whole century uh, with lack. But I do find a huge strength in people that have less access to medical care and develop kind of technologies and a lot of this support group, which is huge families, communities, and social support. It is different arrangement of life. So what I'm asking, and I really beg for this, is guidelines of things that in the day-to-day -day care that you may be getting from a nurse, that you may be getting from a physical therapist, that you may be getting from the person that changes the catheter or puts the NG, like literally a manual that we can start like giving to families, they have 10 people caring for the kid sometime. So they probably have more people than you have available, mm -hmm. but they have no knowledge on what to expect and what to do. And they do have the will, the capacity and mm -hmm. the love to do it sure. with immense impact for these things. So if you can work, and literally I'm asking for guideline, manual, handbook okay. <laughs> of not just what a father does or a mother does but i'm asking for all those other roles that you can probably develop things that are adaptable to other situations with less resources i've already just finished a take-home leukodystrophy book but i'm it's, it's draft um and i've presented it to my government who looked at it and said well you know we don't need advocates but it, it's a it's a when, when published, it'll be a nice, glossy, 30-odd page brochure, and this is what leukodystrophy is. And it's written at the level of the patient, um, and it explains what it is, what it's going to mean. It, I'm talking about all the leukodystrophies, so we don't go into one specific. We talk about this is what it does, this is what, how it affects the body, this is the support you, would, you, know, you will need. Um, it has resource material in there, what's available in, you know, in my country. The phone numbers, the contact, you know, uh, all the, every piece of resource material that you need. And it has links there. I mean, I've, it's sitting in, under the table there. You're very welcome to have a look at it. Look, so, yeah. Isn't that what uh, Galea and uh, Hunter's Hope are doing with the LCN? Is putting that kind of guidelines together? As I believe so, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 but they're so expanding beyond that, I think, yeah. to go beyond clinical, right? Because yeah. it's run by a family. Isn't it run by fam Isn't the family mostly on the... the uh... Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so patients and, and are, are, are part of 
part of this. I, you know, I think there are sort of different levels of to this, and mm. clearly some of what you're talking about is mm. how do we overcome social isolation, yeah. uh, whether we are in South America or here, and what disease uh, does to us. So. I just